friends, once again, welcome to Foundation Church. A special welcome to all of you worshiping with us in Oxford today or online as we continue this four-part series that we started a few weeks back called Back to Basics. We said that sometimes, especially in the world of the church, we like to use big, complicated words, and sometimes it gets a little confusing. Sometimes it's easy to get sidetracked and not even focus on what really matters. And so this series is designed with four simple questions to guide us through some really easy and some really basic things that we think matter the most. Uh, So if you weren't with us previous weeks, if this is your very first time, or if, like me, you struggle to remember what breakfast was this morning, let alone what you did a few weeks ago, let me really quickly catch you up. The very first week, we talked about who is God. That was the simple question we used, and we said, look, we're not going to be able to exhaustively cover God, but we identified three things that we thought were really important. The number one was we said God doesn't only call big, powerful, rich, wealthy, famous, popular people, but God calls regular people, even, dare I say, nobodies, people who don't think they're that important at all. The other thing we said about God is that God wants to save everybody. God longs to save us, and finally we said that God wants to be in relationship with us. Well, last week we tackled the second easy, simple question, and that is, what about Jesus? And we said that while that's an easy question. Jesus is a big topic as well. But we identified three things that we thought were important. The first one we said was Jesus came to save us. Some people think that Jesus came to show us where we were doing things wrong and yell at us. That's not true. Uh, Jesus came to help us and to save us. The second thing we identified was that that salvation was costly to Jesus. As a matter of fact, it cost him his life. And the third thing we said about Jesus was he chose this out of love for each and every one of us. He chose to die on your behalf, because he loves you. Well, today we're going to tackle another simple question, and that is, what is the Bible? We probably will not cover everything there is to know about the Bible. You won't leave here with some kind of master's degree in the Bible, but hopefully you'll know a couple important things about that. With that said, I want to read our primary scripture passage to you. This is going to come from Psalm 119. I'm actually going to jump around a little bit. We're going to start in verse um, 89. And then I'm going to jump to verse 97 and read 97 to 105. Feel free to follow along with the Bible you brought, but don't be afraid to just look at the screen. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commandments are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate On your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path, so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. This is God's word. It's given freely to each and every one of you. So we're going to go back to that, what is the Bible question? And I have to be honest, I've heard a lot of really, really good answers around this. So some people just flat out say, well, the Bible is the word of God. Others, including the author of this psalm, say the Bible is the law. Some people say that the Bible is the story of God's chosen people throughout a period of time, And I've even heard some say that the Bible is a love letter between God and God's people. These are all great answers. These are all correct and right and cover certain aspects of the Bible. But the image that I want you to latch on to today is the Bible is a flashlight. We're going simple here. It's a flashlight. Probably all of us have used a flashlight. Maybe some of us have used flashlights with dying or dead batteries and found that it's not very good. Uh, my family and I, we, we went on vacation recently, and we gathered up all the flashlights we could find in the house for a New Year's Eve beach walk. And so we go out late at night on the beach when nobody else is there. It's cold, so we're wearing coats, and we walk around with our flashlights and see what we can find. Now, in previous years, we've done this, and what we found was the flashlights we had were less than ideal. They were lacking. Uh, they like, had, like, I don't know, like the light of a candle, maybe less than one candle, right? Really terrible. And so kids are walking in the ocean waves, or at least that's the excuse they're giving me. 
Well, the flashlight's so bad, Dad, I just couldn't see. Uh, people are tripping on sandcastles or other sand creations, uh, and we're not finding any kind of cool treasures. And so this year I said, enough of this playing around. I'm going to buy, like, the king of all flashlights. And so I went to the local Walmart, and I found the, the biggest, brightest, most powerful flashlight I could reasonably afford, uh, which turned out to be a handheld flashlight that shines 710 lumens, which, just imagine, it's like a spotlight in your hand. It is amazing. And, and, you know, I brought it home and showed everyone by pointing it in their eyes and blinding them. Now, I really badly wanted to bring that flashlight here today uh, and show you all, but there's two reasons why I didn't. Number one, I was worried that I would blind you. Uh, and number two, I couldn't find it. So <laughs> that's probably the bigger reason. I just couldn't find it. The flashlight was amazing, and it had this little function where you could make it like wider or a tighter beam. And so as we were walking on the beach with this super flashlight, now the kids and Crystal, they all brought their own lights, but once they saw the awesome power of mine, they just turned theirs off. And everyone just walked with me. It was amazing. I had all the control. And, and we got to the point where I was saying, you have to stay in the light. You have to walk in the light. You know, the kids are walking ahead. I'm like, you can't go out of the light. If you go out of the light, you're in a spot you don't belong. And so I'm literally directing my children from a distance with the flashlight. A little to this way, guys. No, no, back this way. And I'm turning the, it was, it was incredible. Uh, if you've never walked in the dark with a group of kids with a flashlight like that, it's fabulous. All the power is yours. I think this is a lot like God's word, though. As we talk about what is the Bible, and I suggest to you that it's a flashlight, I want to suggest that God's word not only lights the path that we're supposed to be on, but also lets us see the paths we can't go on. You see, the dark spots, they become so much more clear when you're standing in the light spots. So, so let's go back to that passage that we talked about. That's Psalm 119. There's a couple important things to know about that. Uh, the first one is Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in your Bible. Like the other day, I tried to read it, and I got like a quarter of the way through it, and I just quit. I was like, this is too much reading for me. I'm, I'm soft like that, right? It, it turns out that it's, it's uh, something like, Psalm 119 is something like 176 verses, 2,542 words, uh, and is broken up into 22 different sections. Each section corresponds to a different letter in the Hebrew Bible, or in the Hebrew alphabet. And so what you have is a psalm literally written about God from A to Z. And it's meant to be overwhelming when you read it. The author's intention was to overwhelm you as you read it in a similar way that God and God's reality is overwhelming to us if we experience it. Uh, overwhelming in a good way. But we're only looking at a tiny portion of it today, and I want to draw your attention to three of the early verses I read. It's verses 98, 99, and 100. Uh, and in those three verses, there are three words that the author uses to talk about the Bible, to talk about God's word. He says that the Bible makes him wiser than his enemies, gives him more insight than all of his teachers, and more understanding than the elders. And what we have here going on is the author's not saying that the Bible teaches him more knowledge. Right? Certainly he doesn't know more than his teachers. Otherwise, he would be the teacher. And certainly he doesn't know more than all the elders. They've lived a little bit longer. They've experienced things he hasn't. But what he is saying is that the Bible gives him a sense of wisdom, an ability to discern between uh, not just the knowledge, but how to use the knowledge. And he says because of that, because he reads his Bible, because he's studying God's word, he doesn't only know stuff. He knows how to apply the stuff he knows. That's a really, really big deal. As a matter of fact, he continues on and shows us this in verse 101. In verse 101, he says, I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. Uh, going back to the flashlight imagery again, God's word has lit the path, and he knows not only where the right path is, but where the wrong path is, right? So he can see clearly where to go, and also, by process of elimination, where not to go. Uh, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but sometimes in my life, I find myself saying, I don't know, it felt like the right thing to do at the time, uh, and in hindsight, it was absolutely the wrong thing. The author of Psalm 119 is suggesting that the Bible gives you like a little heads up on what the wrong thing is. And finally, we ended our passage with verse 105 with him saying, God, your word is a lamp. Uh, it's a lamp for my feet. It's a light to my path. It shines brightly on where I am supposed to go. This is all really, really valuable. At this point, though, you may be saying, John, I'm not sure if I fully understand what is the Bible. 
I'm not sure if you're really helping me understand those three simple things uh, or those few simple things that you think are important. And so let's explicitly name those. The first thing that I, I'm suggesting to you the Bible does is it lights our paths. It gives us light, lets us know where we're supposed to go and likewise where we're not supposed to go. The second thing is the Bible guides us. Right? It's like me on the beach shining the light a little this way, a little that way, saying, come over here, go over there. It guides where we're meant to go. It doesn't only show us the path, but then it offers us helpful suggestions, tips, or direction on how to get to where we're supposed to be going. And the third one, and this perhaps is the most important, is that the Bible blesses us. It offers us blessings in the midst of that, right? It would do nothing if it just guided a path, told you to go on it, and every time you followed, it was terrible, right? Nobody would follow that path. Like, if I led my children out into the ocean every time, my son probably would love that, but the other two would stop following the light I was shining. What we want to suggest today is that the Bible blesses you if you follow the path it lays out. And I want to give you a, a really quick, really practical example of this, but first I want to direct your attention to one of the paths that the Bible lays out for us. It comes from the book of James, chapter 1, verse 19. James chapter 119 in part says everyone, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. This is like great advice. Younger me, like somewhere around the age of 14 to 18, 13 to 17, somewhere around that window of time, younger me didn't know this, didn't care about this. Uh, as a matter of fact, I never listened. I was always speaking. And to give you some example of my anger level, I had a football coach, a JV football coach in, in ninth grade, who in the middle of practice where we were like running full speed into each other, looked at me, pointed at me and said, Martin, for a Christian, you're a really angry guy. <laughs> this is a sport where they encourage controlled aggression. And he was calling me out and saying, you might be a little too angry. Maybe you need to tone it down a little bit. This was who I was and, and the way I acted. Now, this was a hallmark of being a teenage boy. It wasn't like I was that unusual or I was some terror and people were like, John is the worst. But this really was problematic for me when a few years later, I felt this profound call from God to be a pastor, to go into ministry. You see, in, in my church, what I had to do was go back home to the church I grew up in. I had to talk to my pastor and then I had to go stand in front of my congregation, the people who saw little Johnny grow up from a little guy, experience that angry dude who talked too much and never listened. And then I had to say to them, guys, I feel called by the Lord to become a pastor. Now, the congregation did exactly what you're supposed to do in church. When a young person stands up front and does something, they politely applauded, right? That's how that works. But afterwards, we had like a little reception and several people came up to me and said, man, I never would have guessed it, including two former teachers of mine who came together. I think they thought there's strength in numbers. They came together, and it was like a cartoon. You know the cartoon where the jaw drops to the floor? Their jaws were dragging as they came walking to me. And they said, I can't believe that you wanted to be a pastor. And then they went on to expand upon that and said, I could have seen you as something that talked because you talked a lot. Like maybe a lawyer or a business person or just a person who stands out in the street and screams at people. But I can't believe that you want to be a pastor. Now, this was a little bit of a wake-up call for me, right? This was one of those moments where I was like, maybe there's something to their hesitation around me leading other people to Jesus. Maybe they're on to something. And I can't say that I have this all figured out. I can't tell you honestly that I'm always quick to listen and slow to speak and I don't ever get angry. Uh, there are days when I screw it up, right? I can't shut my mouth. I can't listen well enough. I get angry. My family can tell you that happens on occasion. But I'm working on this. I'm striving to follow that light that Jesus has laid out before us. And the cool thing is that now when people meet me, and we get talking about what do you do, and I say I'm a pastor, their jaws don't hit the floor. They don't say things like, quit lying, what do you really do for a living? You're a truck driver, aren't you? I can tell, right? That's not the reaction I get anymore. And I assume this is because I'm following this path that God has laid out for me in a way that's now blessing me. As a matter of fact, some people say, I knew it. I could just tell. Uh, 
which makes me really uncomfortable also, have to be honest. <laughs> so when we're talking about what is the Bible, the Bible's a lot of things. It's a lot of really, really good things, including it's, it's a really old book, right? Like the newest parts of this book were written thousands of years ago. And so if when you try to read the Bible, you come upon it and say, I don't understand this, this doesn't make sense to me, this seems really weird to me, I don't own an ox, why do I have to worry if my ox gores someone? That's in your Bible, Leviticus, this ox-goring laws. Really important stuff. It's okay. It's okay because it was written in a culture that is different from ours. But what I want to suggest to you in summary here is that the Bible is valuable. As a matter of fact, it offers at least these three things. It lights the path before you. It gives you some insight into what's next. It lets you know where you should go and where you shouldn't go without having to make that stupid mistake on your own. It guides us. It doesn't only show us the path, but then it says, please do this. And finally, if we follow that path, the Bible blesses us. It's a very real blessing. Now, it could be at this point today that you're like, hey, I'm kind of inspired or encouraged to read my Bible or to read from the Bible a little bit. Where do you suggest, Pastor, that I read? Oh, thanks so much for asking, friends. I talk to myself also. I read from the book of James. James is this book in the second half of your Bible. I'll just show you real quick. It's like here in your Bible, okay? So if you open your Bible almost to the end, you'll come across the book of James. The book of James is this really short book. It's got five chapters. But I have to be honest, if you're a little daunted by reading five chapters, you heard the pastor stand up and say he couldn't even read one psalm the other day. Uh, James chapter 1 is like a little summary of the entire book of James. And so if you just read James chapter 1, one little chapter in that book, you're going to get a whole bunch of practical advice on how you're supposed to live, how you're supposed to be. It might be a blessing to you today, this week, or even this month. Uh, so if you're inspired, I would encourage you to at least check that out today. With that said, friends, this is part number three of our Back to Basics series. Again, we've been trying to go with really simple questions to talk about some really important, bigger things. Next week, we're going to hit the last part of this series, and I'm going to invite you to come on back and join us for that. But, but uh, right now, I want to invite you to pray with me, if you would. God, we give you thanks. Thanks for your word that you give to us so freely. The blessings that it provides, the light that it shines on our paths, and the reminder uh, that we don't have to learn every hard lesson all by ourselves, but rather we can learn from your wisdom. We can take the knowledge you give and apply it in ways that bless us and others. In Jesus' name we pray.